Again, it is so good to be with all of you and all of you who are gathering for worship at home. And we gather in this place because God calls us. He unites us by his spirit and he calls us to live our lives with him as the center. To worship in every single area of our lives, whether that be how we spend our money or how we think about relationships and the call to reconciliation. To be gathered around the apostles' teaching like we talked about just last week and around the grace and goodness of Jesus Christ. And so as we come into worship, we worship the triune God who indeed unites us, who has created us in love, who has brought us together in order to flourish, who has created out of the tohu vabohu, to use that Hebrew phrase from Genesis chapter 1, out of the formlessness and voidedness of pre-creation, how he has created a world that is just literally uh, bursting with beauty. And as we've been making our way through this period of COVID, I've been asking this question, and I ask it of you. What is God teaching us? What is God teaching us as an individual? And what is God teaching us as a community? And I've asked myself that same question, and I've always landed on the same answer, that God is teaching me about his beauty, about his mystery, about his goodness. And I see that in so many different places. And our psalm that becomes our call to worship today celebrates the goodness of God. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. And we do so today, not with voices projected, but with humming if we're here, and again, pro projected voices if you are at home. Praise the Lord with the harp. Make music to him on the ten-stringed lyre. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully and, and shout for joy. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made their starry host by the breath of his mouth. He gathers the waters of the sea into jars. He puts the deep into storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the people of the world revere him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help. He is our shield. In him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord, even as we put our hope in you. I'd like to now invite the praise team forward as we uh, sing together, or as the praise team sings together. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. <laughs> my soul, the King of heaven, to his favor your grip bring, ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven, evermore his praises sing. Well, I 
Christ, receive God's welcome. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the fellowship of his spirit be with you all, and all God's people say, Amen. I think it appropriate this morning to turn and give a greeting. It doesn't, it can't be a shake, but please wave and greet one another. If you want to do the Japanese bow, that would be perfectly appropriate. It is good to see you. I'm sure for you, this is just so refreshing. As we gather, let's join together in a word of prayer. Our gracious God, Heavenly Father, in the quietness of this space, meet us through your whisper. In the sanctuary that you have called us to, meet us through the power of your Holy Spirit, whether we are here or gathered at home. We pray, Lord, that you would remind us again of your goodness. We pray, Lord, that you would remind us again of, of who we are as brothers and sisters united in grace and called together as your church. And we pray, Lord, again, that you would speak to us this morning, for we pray in Jesus, your Son's name. Amen. You may be seated. We opened our worship this morning with the words of Psalm 33, that celebration of how God has revealed himself in the beauty of creation. And the psalm immediately prior to that, Psalm 32, calls us into a time of confession. I'm going to be reading from verses 1 through 7. Where the psalmist writes, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered, Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them, and whose spirit is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long, for day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was sapped and as in the heat of summer, and then I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover up my iniquity, I said, I will confess my trans transgressions to the Lord, and, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Therefore, let all the faithful pray to you while you may be found. Surely the rising of the mighty waters will not reach them. You are my hiding place. You will protect me from trouble and surround me with songs of deliverance. The psalmist says that it was because of his silence that caused him to waste away and indeed, there is so much heavy, so many things that are heavy upon us, so much that we carry, so much that we dare not utter. But let us dare. Let us dare together to declare our brokenness, and let us no longer remain silent 
and let us acknowledge our brokenness before God. Let's join together now in a time of prayer, and there will be times of silent confession. But use this time to again listen to the whisper of God. God of goodness and mercy, you created us good, and we have not lived up to your expectation. We have spoken when we should have stayed silent. We have tried to hide from you rather than trust your protection. We have chosen to be covered by our sin when we have, could have been covered by your goodness. We have done all these things, and we are doing all these things, and we will do all these things. And so hear our prayer this day. God of deliverance. You created us even this day and in the days to come. This alone is our hope. This alone is our life. This alone is our salvation. Create within us a heart of repentance and trust. Create within us a heart of faithfulness. Surround us with glad cries of deliverance that we may hear your grace, that we may receive your song and that we may sing of your goodness. This we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Friends in Jesus Christ, hear the good news. God has heard our cry. God has forgiven us. God has renewed us. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. And again, as we sing... Let us, let us use this time of song where we will sing, Take My Life and Let It Be, as a time of reflection and a time of prayer. team can go to their seats and Mary if you will come up and give an introduction to the offering and a prayer that would be wonderful
Today in our offering prayer, I would like to pray for World Renew as it responds to the disaster in Beirut. I will read an excerpt which came from more than a week ago in August 8 update. Our partner, Marath, is well positioned to, re to respond to the needs of the affected communities. They have already provided over 1,000 hot meals to families in Beirut and will continue to provide food for affected families even as assessments are carried out to guide further relief efforts. It is expected that early efforts will focus on the distribution of essentials like food and hygiene kits. <clears throat> until, um, until August 24, all Canadian do donations will be matched one-to-one -one by the Canadian government. Offering plates are in the foyer. Today's newsletter also outlines how donations may be made to the Water Street Church to support its work and the ministries of the Christian Reformed Church in North America. May I lead you in prayer? Dear Father in heaven, there is so much turmoil, hurt, and despair in the world. Today we want to pray for Lebanon as it deals with the effects of the explosion in Beirut. We pray for the many who have lost lives and homes. May they find comfort and healing. We pray for medical staff who care for the injured. Lord, we pray that you will grant wisdom for, for those in positions of responsibility that they may manage the catastrophic human and economic consequences well. Guide the church there as it seeks to comfort the distressed and brokenhearted. Be with the people of God as they seek the Lord and humbly cry out to him for mercy. However, in spite of all we hear, we rest in the assurance that you are with us, Lord, and that you have not forsaken this world. We are assured that you, dear Father, care for your people, that your love is immense, and that you are with us in life's storms. Lead us, Lord, to see how you are at work in Beirut and in other situations. May we be willing to be your hands and feet as we serve you and our neighbors. Use our gifts in the building of your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Will you please cue up the children's moment? Hi guys! If there's any kids out here, we're doing the children's moment. Maybe you're here at the church with me, or maybe you're watching this from home. Wherever you are, I'm happy to see you guys. This week we want to talk a little bit about what it means to love each other. And we've done that a lot this summer. So I want to ask you, what are the ways that we have tried to show people, even strangers who we don't know, that we love them? Because Jesus loves us. Can you think of some of the things we've done this summer? If you talked about growing vegetables, we've done that and we've shared them with families who are new to Canada and might not have the money to be able to buy all the fresh fruits and vegetables they need for their families. Or maybe it's other kind of food we've shared. Maybe it was buying school supplies for kids who otherwise might not be able to get new things for school. We've done lots of things, and how has your family decided to show people love this summer? That's what we want to talk more about today, and we want to talk about what it looks like for our church family to love one another. And the Bible has so much to say about that. So we're going to read a story again from this book, Growing in God's Love, a storybook Bible, and it is called A Loving Heart That Helps Others, and it's from the book of James. So maybe you can see the pictures. Parents and teachers tell you many important things. I bet your list is really long of the things they've taught you. How do you remember it all? Here's a letter from a man named James who wrote it when the church was just getting started. So it was a letter for one of the very first churches. He wanted the people in the church to remember 
what Jesus had taught about how to treat other people. Here's what he said. Brothers and sisters, it's not always easy living together in a family at home or at church. So if something happens that makes you angry or mad, pause for a minute, take a deep breath, and listen before you talk. It's good to slow down, to stop and think. When we listen to others, we learn about them. We learn why they do or say certain things. Another thing to remember about hearing and doing is this. Look at yourself in the mirror. What do you see? What do you see when you look in the mirror? Do you see someone who knows the right thing to do in his head, but forgets and does the wrong thing instead? Sometimes, maybe. Or do you see someone who knows the right thing to do and does it? God wants the things you know and the things you do to go together. The third thing to remember is about how you treat other people. Think about this and what you do. Let's say you get to church and you see two people in the room. One person is dressed in really nice and fancy clothes and smells like flowers. Then you see someone whose clothes aren't as nice, whose shoes maybe have holes in them, and maybe this person hasn't been able to have a bath in a while. What does God tell us to do then? Well, he wants us to treat all of these people in the same way. God wants us to welcome everyone and help them all the same. And finally, remember to love all people. You will meet many different people, people of all different colors, people of all different shapes and sizes, people of different religions, People who should not be hurt because of the choices that they make. These people may need your help. They may need you to share Jesus' love with them. So be kind. Say nice things to others. Accept them for who they are. Being a friend is the easiest way to help people. God wants us to treat all people with love. And I know you will. So this week, I want to ask you, how can you be a good friend? Some of you are going to be going back to school, and it's going to be hard because it's going to look different. Some of you might even have to wear a mask at school. And that might be hard for you. Or maybe it might be hard for one of your friends. So I want you to think, how can you be a good friend to other people? What does it look like for you to love them? When we know Jesus and when we love him, we have joy in our heart. And so I want to leave you with this song. I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. So get ready to do some actions. It's going to be great, and I pray that the Lord may bless and keep you guys this week. The piece of glasses I'm just standing down in my heart.
wish I could have led you in a resounding chorus of clapping, but I am percussionally challenged. <laughs> it's good to hear so many of you clapping. As we come now into this time of prayer, we lay before God the concerns of our world, the concerns of our congregation, and we prepare our hearts to listen to the word that God will speak to us in just a few moments. And so let us join now together in a word of prayer. Our gracious God, again, we come before you as the author of all things, as the giver of life and all good gifts. And we pray, Lord, that you would increase in us our imagination for how you are at work in our world. May we experience your beauty and your wonder and your love again this morning through the fellowship of believers, even though the fellowship feels different. We give you thanks, Lord, that you meet us through the power of your Holy Spirit, and that in a few moments you will speak to us through your word, reminding us again of who you are in Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, for the many needs in our world, the many needs in our community. We remember those students who will be coming back to the University of Guelph and those students who will be going into high schools and elementary schools. And we ask, Lord, that you would give their teachers and their leaders wisdom, and we do pray, Lord, that you would protect us. We pray, Lord, that we would care for one another well, we would do so as we again embrace it one another, but now embrace one another from distances. We pray for Mrs. Bucker, and we ask, Lord, that in her sorrow as she had to say goodbye to her brother Jonathan, that you would comfort her. We thank you, Lord, that we can gather in this place as your people, bound together by your Holy Spirit. We pray, Lord, for, again, that this uh, virus would be removed from the face of the earth. And so work through scientists, work through doctors and nurses who are, tr are treating patients. And we do pray, Lord, that uh, the normal that we go back to would be the normal that allows us to embrace one another, that the normal that we go back to would be the, the kind of normal where we know that we are bound together as people. We pray, Lord, that you be near to us, for we pray in Jesus, your son's name. Amen. I would invite you to open in your Bibles to the book of Acts. We'll be reading from that same passage in a few moments from Acts chapter 2, that same passage of scripture that we read from just last week. Before we read those words from Acts chapter 2, this past week I was reading an article about leading in churches through this period of COVID-19. And the author of that article talked about the various responses that people have to all of the upheaval that we've been experiencing, experiencing these last few weeks and months, especially when it comes to reopening the church. I want you to listen to some of the things that he wrote, some of the responses that people have given. And, and as we look, we've looked at the survey responses that uh, uh, people in our church gave, these are, are some of the responses. These resonate with what this author was writing about. You can't open the church building. It's a huge health risk. You are wrong to do so. We've heard that one. It's all a big hoax, a conspiracy, a media frenzy. Read this article, this link, this ad. Don't be afraid. My husband, my uncle, my niece just passed away from COVID. Here are the 25 things that you need to do before considering to reopen. My family is going to stay home for a while before coming back and sorry we can't be there. Don't ever open the building again, and we haven't heard that one so much in our congregation, but one, one person said that. Uh, worshiping from home has just been so much better. 
We need to go to church. We need to open the building. We need to do it now, now, now. I need to be there and see everyone. What are you waiting for? At the end of that article, the author of that article talked about how we face a time where the unified body of believers, the church, the church united by the Holy Spirit feels fractured. And so over the last couple of weeks and months, we've been asking the question, well, why does the church matter? Why does, is it important for people to gather with believers, brothers and sisters united by faith? And so today we again read these words, these words that come from the gospel writer Luke. This is part two of, of a two-part volume that he writes about uh, who Jesus is and then the spread of the gospel. We read Ephesians 2 verses 42 through 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as had need. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. This past week, I was reading in the Christian Courier uh, an article where the author talked about what we're going to be talking about this morning, and that is the fellowship of believers, the koinonia, as it is in Greek, of believers, this fellowship that defined that early church That author used the quote from our Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, where our Prime Minister said that we we shouldn't talk or speak moistly on one another. And again, that has been the cause of some humor. We shouldn't speak moistly on one another. Of course, we shouldn't do that at the best of times, but we certainly shouldn't do that during this period of COVID. But in that same article, he talked about how because of how God has revealed himself in Jesus Christ, how because of the incarnation, because of the arrival of the Holy Spirit, the breath of God has been, has been breathed on us, that God has indeed spoken moistly on us and has called us to be incarnate, enfleshed, because that's who Jesus is, to be incarnate, enfleshed to one another. And we ask, well, what does that that look like now that we are in this time of COVID-19? Again, that same author would talk about how in the early church, the early church would, would be united with one another, even those churches that were far off, and they would be united not through Zoom or through Google Hangouts, but they would be united through letters. That church was propelled into the world of Rome, the diaspora of those who are persecuted in Jerusalem, the the separated ones, the the ones that, that went out from Jerusalem because of persecution, that it was because of that persecution. The seeds of the church were planted in all sorts of different areas of the world. Even when, or when John writes to, uh, writes his letter, To stitch together that church through those letters, he writes these words, I have much to write to you, but I do not want to use paper and and ink. Instead, I hope to visit you and talk with you face to face so that our joy may be complete. There is indeed something about talking eye to eye, even through masks, that makes our, our joy complete. We need to think theologically and practically about this call into fellowship, this call that, that God gives to us through Jesus to incarnate his love, to make his love known to our world. 
We need to to think theologically about how how God has revealed himself as three persons in one body, or three in one. We call it the Trinity. A a, a, a three persons so united in purpose and in vision that we don't call them three, but that we call them one. And this call that because of that, because of God revealing himself to us in that way, we too, even though we are different, different. We are called to be one. As I think about how this church has lived this call to be one over the last few months, I have to say, I am so very proud of what we've been able to do together. Amy referred to some of the things that we've been able to do together how we've blessed our community through food, gathering of food, how we've blessed the vulnerable in our community through a gathering every week uh, as, we distri- as, as, as we distribute diapers, as we distribute formula to those women who maybe can't feed their own children. I- I've heard stories about how, how you are also gathering on porches and, ar- and around coffee. I've heard stories about how small groups are still gathering and continuing to to live with one another in the way God has called you to. We indeed are are called to be God's church, and we ask ourselves, well, what does that mean? And we've been trying to define that over the last couple of weeks, and and we've made an attempt to define that as by using these words, the church is the gathering of people around the apostles, teaching around koinonia, around the breaking of bread, around worship. In other words, we are the people who seek to learn from God and from one another. The million and one ways in which the grace of God is applied to every single area of life. How the grace of God applies to our sex lives. How the grace of God applies to the way we think about money. How the grace of God applies to how we think about relationships and this call to to be a forgiving people because God has forgiven us. This call to be reconcilers. This call to to pray that prayer, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This call that that Jesus Christ gave to us and when he talked about the kingdom of God arriving in himself and how through the church, now God is at work restoring all things to himself. And of course, we have to say there is an already to that God is here, but there is also a not yet to that. We still live on this side of the new heavens and the new earth, longing for that day when Christ will return, longing for that day when all things will be made new and we will dwell with one another in peace and we will dwell with our heavenly Father. We read about that in places like Revelation chapter 21. And so Luke, in this passage of Scripture, has told us about how Jesus Christ uh, spoke about the kingdom of God, and we have spoken about the kingdom of God, and then he ascended before their very eyes into the heavens. He told them to, or he told that 120 people who were gathered in Jerusalem at that time during, uh, during that celebratory feast in the, in the city of Jerusalem, he told that 120 to, to wait until the promised Holy Spirit would come. And we are told about how that Holy Spirit descends on those 120 in that upper room and and how they begin to speak in tongues they had never learned. How they began to speak in, in, in languages that people could understand and those people were wondering if they were drunk. Those people were asking themselves, how do these, these simple men speak in languages that they had never learned? We are told through the, the, that, that, that through the testimony, the witness of those people, as well as through the witness of Peter, who would come along and preach that famous sermon that we find in Acts chapter 2, how through Peter and through the witness of those 120, that 3,000 people were added to their number. And then we are told about this gathering of people, this this story in the book of Acts chapter 2, this story of how and what this church did. They gathered around the apostles' teaching, which we talked about last week. They gathered with one another, the Koinonia Fellowship. 
They gathered around the breaking of bread, and and that might mean that they were gathered around meals, but one of the rhythms of the early church was that in the midst of those meals where they were gathered in their homes, how in the midst of those meals they would take a moment to remember what Jesus Christ had done for them, how they gathered for prayer, for worship, to worship the God who had made them, the God who had redeemed them, the God who had revealed himself in, in Jesus Christ. And today we want to look at how they dedicated themselves to koinonia, to the, the fellowship. And this is one of those code words in Christianity. We, we don't often use that word, do we, this word fellowship, unless we're talking about what happens between brothers and sisters united in faith. We don't use that word when we, we go out and we hang out with people at the bar maybe, or at a hockey game. But we might use that word when talking about gathering around a meal with a brother or sister in Jesus. It was good fellowship. But what Paul is talking about is way more than just hanging out. Paul would go on to talk about what that looks like in in, in verse 44. All the believers were together. They had everything in common. And the English word there is the English, or the Greek word there is the, uh, the word, a form of that word koinonia. What does that mean? People were selling their property to give to those who had need. They were eating with glad and sincere hearts. There was a priority, a commitment, a regular practice to gather both in in large group gatherings as well as in small group gatherings to encourage and to share. Koinonia. To share the resources of time, to share the resources of money that God had given to them, to share the resources of their home, to share the resource of of uh, uh, the uh, the resources that God had given to them. And Luke would would go on to talk about this in in various parts of the book of Acts. In fact, there are about a half a dozen different places where Luke describes this fellowship of believers. We find one of those places in Acts chapter 4. And I highly recommend that you would read the entire book. In verse 32 of chapter 4, we read these words. All of the believers were one in heart and in mind. Stop there for a moment and scratch your heads with me and ask yourself, well, what does that mean? Think about this group for a moment. I've already told you that that this was a group that was literally exploding from its seams, this church that was this gathered people. We we know that there were over 3,000 of them And what Luke is describing in Acts chapter 4 comes a couple of months after what is described in Acts chapter 2. And and we are told that the Lord was adding to their numbers, so we can guess that there were quite a few people. How often have you been in a gathering of people, a large gathering of people, where it could be described of that group, they were one in heart and in mind. It doesn't happen very often unless something extraordinary has happened. This was a group that were mostly ethnically Jewish, but they were from all over the Mediterranean. This was a group that probably ate different foods. This was a group that, that when they had come to Jerusalem and had heard the good news, they decided to stay. They decided to stay and, and gather with the people there. The plot thickens in verse 33 of that same book of the Bible, Acts chapter 4. With great power, the apostles continued to to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. They were doing their job as they continued to to testify. And then we read on that, that great grace was upon them all, for there were no needy people. Great grace, these two words this word grace, and this word koinonia. And, and, Paul, and Luke is connecting those two words, and, and he's connecting this word that, that is so central to the gospel, the euangelion, the good news of scripture, this word grace. 
This, this word that describes what, what God was doing in his people, those same people who had rebelled against him, those same people who had pushed him away, that God, through his grace, gave them a gift that they did not deserve and gave them something, I gave them a, a gift that they did not deserve, and that was his love. Grace is this idea that they didn't get what they do, did deserve, and that was his punishment. But they got something different. And Luke connects those words, charis, grace, with koinonia. And in connecting those two words, he is, he's, he's communicating this, this idea that, that because of what God has done for us as his people by extending to us his grace in Jesus Christ, by living, dying, being raised to new life and ascending to the right hand of God, by giving to us his grace, we have access now to a power, a power that is bigger than ourselves. A power that calls us to resemble Jesus Christ in the way he showed himself to us on earth. A power that calls us to love. A power that calls us to forgive. A power that, that binds us together as people indeed who are very different. If there's one thing about the church, it is not that we are the same. It is that God is binding so many different people into one body. And that's the miracle of the church. Indeed, it is. I look out at you. And all of you are different. You are different than me. You have different gifts you have different goals in your life. But again, as, as we are bound together by the koinonia, the fellowship that God has called us to, each one of us, in our own way, spur one another along to show the grace and the koinonia to a world and to one another that we so desperately need. And in so doing, God promises to be with us. God promises to be with us to the very end of the age. He propels us out beyond ourselves to be a blessing to the world. And I want to give one more illustration. One more illustration, and this comes to us from the book of Corinthians, chapter 8 where Paul writes these words to that Corinthian church. And, and Paul is, is doing a little bit of bragging, not about himself here, but, but about another church, the church in Macedonia, which had shown great generosity. He writes, And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, or as another translation puts it, in the midst of a, a profound persecution, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty, imagine that, they were persecuted. Their, their sisters or their brothers were, were hauled off into captivity. Their brothers might have been put to death. But in the midst of that, and even in the midst of their extreme poverty, they, did, they didn't turn in on themselves but their extreme poverty welled up in, in great generosity. For I testify, or I swear to God, I testify that they gave as much as they were able, able and, and even beyond their ability, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service of the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord and then by the will of God also to us. And again, there is this connection between the grace that they received and the grace that they extend. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. The grace of generosity. But since you excel in everything, and here he is encouraging this Corinthian church, you excel in faith, you excel in speech, you excel in knowledge, in complete earnestness, in the love we have kindled in you. See also that you excel in the grace of giving. 
The context of those words from the book of Corinthians is the Jerusalem church had experienced a profound famine. There were lots of Christian Jews in that city who were, who were struggling mightily. And so Paul engages in this fundraising effort. He goes to all of the churches and, and he calls them to this idea of being united as brothers and sisters, even brothers and sisters from thousands of miles away, engages in a fundraiser to send money back to this Jerusalem church. And in this passage of scripture, Paul is encouraging that, that Corinthian church to indeed excel in the grace of generosity. In the grace of giving themselves away, even sacrificially, for that's what the Macedonian church was doing. And so, as we conclude our time, what does this mean for you? What does it mean for how you participate in the life of the church? And, and I know that there are some of, uh, in our congregation who are, who are in fly-in-the-wall mode. And here's what I mean by that. There are some in the congregation who, because of a past experience in the church where they, they might have been burned or they might have been hurt, are coming into the church to explore. There are some people who are, are even in the mode of, of questioning and wondering who Jesus is. And, and that's okay. If, if that's where you're at, if you're in fly in the wall, that's okay. But don't stay there for very long. And my motive for telling you to not stay there for very long is not a a selfish motive. It's not good for you. It's not good for you to stay in that mode of being a fly in the wall, an observer. God wants to change and shape your hearts by his grace, and he does that through the church. And he calls you to invest your time and your talent, even your treasure, your, your generosity, your generosity with words, your generosity with your life, your generosity with your joy as we share life together. That's the encouragement. Paul tells us in this passage that this Corinthian church, or that this, uh, this Macedonian church was given something. That they gave more than they were even able to. They gave out of their, uh, their lack. And some of us come to this appeal to, to share life with one another, to, to share our goods with one another, and, and you think to ourselves, how many times do I hear this request to share my money? And we get a little bit fatigued, don't we? And my encouragement to you is this. And here's a quote, and I don't know who the quote came from, but when your passions meet the needs of the world, God works. When, when what, you, what, you, what, what, what you look at and say, I, I want to participate that and, and find one thing that you can give your life and your energy to. Maybe it's mentoring. Maybe it's mentoring young people. M maybe it's beginnings ministry and, and you want to participate in this, this ministry that, that reaches out to, to vulnerable women and to help their children. Maybe it's small group ministries. God is calling you to invest yourself into the lives of people, into the lives of this, this small group of people, and in so doing, I promise that the Lord will indeed bless you because there is a grace in being generous with your time and with your energy. As we conclude this, uh, the message, I want to include with an encouragement. Luke tells us that these people of Macedonia were normal, average citizens. There wasn't anything especially extraordinary about them except that they had been marked by the grace of Jesus Christ and, and that would indeed make, make them exceptional. But they were just normal people who went about their normal lives like you and I go about our normal days and our lives. And God used that church to do something extraordinary. Their story of generosity has been repeated a million times in a million different churches. Imagine what God can do through his people, bound together by grace. 
bound together to, to live with one another and to, to spur one another in the grace that God has shown to you. Imagine. This is the fellowship of believers. This is the fellowship of believers. This is the fellowship of believers that God has united us in. And we say thanks be to God. And so let's say that with me. Thanks be to God. Did I just violate COVID protocol? <laughs> let's stand and again through song, let's sing together our hymn of response. This is one of our favorite songs. My friends, may you grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. And please uh, raise your hands at the appropriate time. We get to may but to God, be, to God be the glory. Ephesian church, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you have received, the grace that you have received. Com be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his face upon you. And may he give you his peace. Amen. I need to give you some instructions on exiting the building. Just a reminder to maintain social distancing protocols of two meters as you exit the building and go outside. You can fellowship uh, in the parking lot. We're going to exit the building by sections. That's section one, this is section two, this is section three and section four. Section one will go out that door, section two out this door, section three out this door, and section four will go out that door and we will exit from the back to the front. So. May the Lord bless you and keep you.